The nervous system plays a role in everything you do. The three main parts are your brain, spinal cord, and nerves. It helps you move, think, and feel. It regulates things you do, but you don't think about, like digestion. It contains the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Your nervous system is your body's command center made up of your brain, spinal cord, and nerves. And it works by sending messages or electrical signals between the brain and other parts of the body, telling you to breathe, move, speak, and see. Your nervous system keep track, keeps track of what's going on inside and outside your body and tells you how to respond to any situation you're in. Your nervous system regulates complicated processes like thoughts and memory, and it plays an essential role in the things in your body and the things that it does without thinking, like blushing, sweating, and blinking. So your nervous system's main function is to send messages from various parts of the body to your brain and from your brain back out to the body to tell your body what to do. The messages regulate your thoughts, your memory, your learning, your feelings, your movements, balance, and coordination, your senses, your wound healing, your sleep, your heartbeat and breathing patterns, how you respond to stressful situations, digestion, and body processes such as puberty and aging. It sends neurons or it actually uses nerve cells called neurons to send signals or messages all over the body. These electrical signals travel among your brain, your skin, your organs, your glands, and your muscles, and moves out to all areas of your body, your limbs, and, since, and helps you feel sensations like pain, your eyes, your ears, your tongue, your nose, and nerves all over your body. The neurological system is responsible for coordinating and regulating all body functions, and it consists of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Your brain and your spinal cord make up your central nervous system. Your brain reads signals from your nerves to regulate how you think, move, and feel. Your peripheral nervous system is made up of a network of nerves. The nerves branch out from your spinal cord. This system relays information from your brain and spinal cord to your organs, arms, legs, fingers, and toes. The central nervous system, again, has the brain and the spinal cord, and these are covered by something called meninges. There are three layers of connective tissue that protect and nourish the central nervous system. The subarachnoid space will surround the brain and the spinal cord, and it's filled with cerebral spinal fluid. It's formed in the ventricles of the brain, and it flows through the ventricles into the space. The fluid-filled space cushions the brain and spinal cord and nourishes the central nervous system, removing waste materials. The electrical activity of the central nervous system is governed by neurons located throughout the sensory and motor neuropathways. The central nervous system contains upper motor neurons that influence lower motor neurons located in the peripheral nervous system. The brain has four major divisions, the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the brain stem, and the cerebellum. It's located in the cranial cavity. The cerebrum is divided into the right and left cerebral hemisphere, joined by the corpus callosum, a bundle of nerve fibers that help communicate between the hemispheres. Each hemisphere sends and receives impulses from opposite sides of the body and has four lobes, the frontal, the parietal, the temporal, and the occipital. These lobes are composed of a substance known as gray matter. Gray matter has a large neuronal bodies, a large number of neuronal bodies. That's actually where it gets its color. The gray matter is the seat of the human's unique ability to think and reason. It is the place where the processing of sensation, perception, voluntary movement, learning speech, and cognition takes place. 
White matter gets its color from a protective coloring covering over the axons called the myelin sheath. The white matter's role is to provide communication between different gray matter areas and between gray matter and the rest of your body. Gray matter throughout your central nervous system is essential for controlling movement, memory, and emotions. Different areas of your brain are responsible for various functions. Gray matter plays a significant role in all aspects of human function. The diencephalon lies beneath the cerebral hemispheres and consists of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Most sensory impulses travel through the gray matter of the thalamus, which is responsible for screening and directing the impulses to specific areas of the cerebral cortex. The hypothalamus, which is part of the autonomic nervous system, which is part of the peripheral nervous system, is responsible for regulating several body functions, including the balance of water, appetite, vital signs such as temperature, blood pressure, pulse, and respiratory rate, sleep cycles, pain perception, and emotional status. The brain stem is located between the cerebral cortex and the spinal cord. It consists, it's consisted of mostly nerve fibers. It has three parts, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. The midbrain serves as a relay center for the ear and eye reflexes and relays between the higher cerebral centers, the lower pons, medulla, cerebellum, and spinal cord. The brain stem actually connects the brain to the spinal cord and sends messages to the rest of the body to regulate balance, breathing, heart rate, and more. The midbrain is the top part of the brain stem and that's crucial for regulating eye movement. The pons is the middle portion of the brain stem and that coordinates facial movements, hearing, and balance. And then the medulla oblongata is the bottom part of the brain stem that helps regulate your breathing, your heart rhythms, your blood pressure, and your swallowing. Your brain stem also contains your reticular activating system or your RAS system, which is a bunch of neurons or cells that carry electrical signals and chemicals throughout the brain. The RAS controls your sleep and wake cycles and helps you stay alert and attentive for your surroundings. The pons also links the cerebellum to the cerebrum and the midbrain to the medulla. It's responsible for various reflexes. The medulla oblongata contains the nuclei for cranial nerves and centers to control and regulate respiratory functioning, heart rate and force, and blood pressure. The cerebellum is located behind the brainstem and under the cerebrum. It has two hemispheres. Although the cerebellum does not initiate movement, its primary function includes coordination and smoothing of voluntary movements, maintenance of equilibrium, and maintenance of muscle tone. This is showing the different areas of the brain that we just discussed and where they're located at. Again, the pons, the medulla, oblongata, the cerebellum, you can see how they're connected. The cerebellum's here behind that brain stem, okay? And then here's where the brain stem and the spinal cord start to connect. The spinal cord is located in the vertebral canal and it extends from the medulla oblongata to the first lumbar vertebra. The inner part of the cord has an H-shaped appearance and it's made up of two pairs of columns, the dorsal and the ventral, consisting of gray matter. The outer part is made up of white matter and surrounds the gray matter. The spinal cord conducts sensory impulses up ascending tracks to the brain, conducts motor impulses down descending tracks to neurons that will stimulate the muscles throughout the body and it's responsible for reflex activity. Reflex activity can involve various neural structures. For example, the stretch reflex, the simplest type of reflex arc involves one sensory neuron, afferent, one motor neuron, efferent, and one synapse. An example of this is the knee jerk elicited by tapping the patellar tendon. More complex reflexes involve three or more neurons. The 
So this is just showing you that H-shape appearance, the afferent neuron, the efferent neuron, and the synapse or the junction where that occurs. <clears throat> now impulses, sensory impulses, will travel to the brain by the way of two ascending neuropathways, the spinal thalamic tract and the posterior columns. And the impulses originate in the afferent fibers of the peripheral nervous system and carried throughout the posterior route to the spinal cord. Sensation of pain, temperature, and crude and light touch travel through the spinal thalamic tract. Sensations of position, vibration, and fine touch will travel through the posterior columns. Motor impulses are conducted to the muscles by the two descending neuropathways, the pyramidal or corticospinal tract and the extrapyramidal tract. The motor neurons of the pyramidal tract originate in the motor cortex and travel down to the medulla. Then they cross to the opposite side and travel down the spinal cord where they synapse with lower motor neuron in the anterior horn of the spinal cord. The impulses are then carried to the muscles and they produce voluntary movement. This involves skill and purpose. The extra pyramidal tract motor neurons consist of motor neurons that originate in the motor cortex, basal ganglia, brain stem, and spinal cord outside the pyramidal tracts, and they travel from the frontal lobe to the pons where they cross over to the opposite side, go down the spinal cord where they connect with the lower motor neurons that conduct the impulses to the muscles. The neurons conduct impulses related to the maintenance of muscle tone and body control. So just to explain it a little bit simpler, neuropathways that connect the brain and the spinal cord are called ascending and descending tracts, and they're responsible for carrying the sensory and the motor messages to and from the periphery of the body. So for example, this is how the sensation from your fingertip reaches your brain and how conscious and reflexive actions return to your finger in response to that message. So which lobe is responsible for interpreting tactile sensations such as pain and temperature? And that's going to be the parietal lobe. The parietal lobe interprets tactile sensations. The frontal lobe directs voluntary skeletal actions, communications, emotions, intellect, judgment, and so on. The occipital lobe is the primary visual receptor center. The temporal lobe receives and interprets impulses from the ear. The peripheral nervous system carries information to and from the central nervous system, and it consists of 12 pairs of cranial nerves, 31 pairs of spinal nerves. The nerves are categorized as two types of fibers, either somatic or autonomic. Somatic fibers carry central nervous system impulses to voluntary skeletal muscle. Autonomic fibers carry central nervous impulses to smooth involuntary muscle in the heart and the glands. The somatic nervous system mediates conscious or voluntary activities, whereas the autonomic nervous system mediates unconscious or involuntary activities. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves that evolve from the brain or the brain stem. These nerves transmit motor or sensory messages. The nurse must remember the names of these 12 cranial nerves when assessing the client. A useful mnemonic for the 12 cranial nerves in Table 25-2 is On Old Olympus, Towering Tops, A Finn and a German Viewed Some Hops. To recall the type of impulse each nerve carries listed in column two of this table, another useful mnemonic is some say marry money, but my brother says bad business marries money. The third column in the table provides the primary function of each cranial nerve.
Cranial nerves send electrical signals between your brain, your face, your neck, and your torso. They can help you taste, smell, hear, and feel sensations. They can also help you make facial expressions, blink your eyes, and move your tongue. You have 12 cranial nerve pairs. Each nerve pair splits to serve two sides of your brain. You have one pair of olfactory nerves. One olfactory nerve is on the left side of your brain and one is on the right side of your brain. Each of the 12 cranial nerves have a specific function. The olfactory nerve pertains to sense of smell. Optic nerve, ability to see. Oculomotor nerve, ability to move and blink your eyes. Trochlear nerve, ability to move your eyes up and down or back and forth. Trigeminal nerve, sensations in your face, cheeks, taste, and jaw movements. Abducens nerve, ability to move your eyes. Facial nerve, facial expressions and sense of taste. Auditory vestibular nerve, sense of hearing and balance. Glossopharyngeal nerve, ability to taste and swallow. Vagus nerve, digestion and heart rate. Accessory nerve or spinal accessory nerve, shoulder and back muscle movement, and hypoglossal nerve, ability to move your tongue. So then you see that they're also um, on the screen here. You have one, which is your olfactory, okay, and it tells you the mnemonic that it matches up with and the type of impulse that it helps. So you can try to line those up uh, or come up with some sort of way to sort of memorize them or remember them because you will have to know them for a while now all right going forward so uh, you'll be tested on the cranial nerves for sure as you continue on uh, through okay so you want to know those so learn that mnemonic this is showing you the um, different cranial nerves and the location of each one of those nerves. Remember that, again, they're on both sides of the brain. So if you have one, you have two, one on the right, one on the left. All right, and then we have spinal nerves. Spinal nerves are eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, one a coccygeal, and then the 31 pairs of spinal nerves are named after the vertebrae below each one's exit point along the spinal cord. You can see that in figure 25-2 in your book on page 576. Each nerve is going to be attached to the spinal cord by two nerve roots. The sensory afferent fiber enters the dorsal posterior root of the cord, and then the motor afferent fiber exits through the ventral anterior root of the cord. The sensory root of each spinal nerve innervates an area of the skin called a dermatone. Spinal nerves are an integral part of the peripheral nervous system. They are the structures through which the central nervous system receives the sensory information from the peripheral and through which the activity of the trunk and the limbs is regulated. They also transmit the motor commands from the central nervous system to the muscles of the periphery. They're composed of both motor and sensory fibers, as well as autonomic fibers, and exist as 31 pairs of nerves emerging intermittently from the spinal cord to, the, to exit the vertebral canal. Some of the peripheral nerves have a special function that are associated with automatic activities, and they are referred to as the autonomic nervous system. Now, impulses from the autonomic nervous system are carried out by both cranial and spinal nerves. They're carried from the central nervous system to involuntary smooth muscles that make up the walls of the, hearts, of the heart and the glands. The autonomic nervous system helps keep us in homostasis. It incorporates the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system, or the fight or flight system, is activated during stress 
and elicits responses like decreased gastric secretions, bronchial dilation, increased pulse rate, and pupil dilation. The sympathetic fibers arise from the thoracolumbar level T1 to L2 of the spinal cord. The parasympathetic nervous system functions to restore and maintain normal body function, for example, by decreasing the heart rate. The parasympathetic fibers arise from the craniosacral region S1 to S4 and cranial nerves 3, 6, 9, and 10. Is the following statement true or false? Sympathetic nervous system is activated during stress. True. Sympathetic nervous system is activated during stress and elicits responses such as decreased gastric secretions, bronchial dilation, dilatation, uh, increased pulse rate, and pupil dilatation. Now, although cerebrovascular disease can have neurological effects, the cause is actually vascular. Patterns of ethnic variation occur in cerebrovascular disease with stroke. In the United States, uh, the states of the stroke belt have a greater occurrence of stroke and vascular disease, and this could be due to higher percentages of older adult African-American dietary factors. The stroke belt is composed of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Tennessee. The states with the highest incidence are North and South Carolina, are also called the stroke buckle. Children born and living in these states during childhood are at a greater risk for stroke in adulthood. A condition called nerves or bad nerves is more of a mental condition than a condition of the nerves. In the South, symptoms of this condition are the same as those for anxiety or worry and may include crying spells. This condition may refer to a serious emotional disorder or mental breakdown. A similar condition has a culture-bound syndrome, attack de nerveos or nerve attack in Latin Americans. It's mostly emotional with various expressions. There's a feeling of impending loss of control, chest tightness, heat in the body, palpation, shaking in the arms and legs, uh, imminent fainting, Clients fear dying or may engage in behavior that results from loss of control, such as committing suicide or attempting to hurt others. You will be asking the client about uh, health history, personal health history, current concerns, things like that. So in the older adult, what would we expect to see? Uh, normal decrease in their ability to hear, see, taste, and smell. They may experience intentional tremors when extending the hands, nodding, saying yes or no, or extending their tongue. And these are typically related to uh, different um, cranial nerve issues. So olfactory is the uh, smell, okay? And then uh, gloss and glossopharyngeal or cranial nerve nine and cranial nerve uh, seven can also affect the ability to taste. Uh, the hearing can be affected by cranial nerve 8, the acoustic uh, nerve. There's a normal decrease in their ability to hear. Uh, a normal decrease in the ability to see. So this can uh, have happen with dysfunction in cranial nerve 2, which is the optic nerve, cranial nerve 3, which is the ocular motor, cranial nerve 4, which is trochlear, or cranial nerve 6, which is the A abducens. So these can uh, all lead to different issues in the client with um, that's older. Older adults can also experience intentional tremors that occur with intentional movements like extending the hands, head nodding, yes or no. Such tremors are not associated with disease but can be um, a cause of embarrassment or emotional distress. Sometimes these can be caused by things like um, Parkinson's disease, um, use of antidepressants long-term or any sort of psychotropics. Uh, these clients could have tics like from um, Tourette's syndrome or from tardive dyskinesia, 
Um, they can have myoclonus, jerking of the arms and legs, which can be from, again, certain medications, uh, chorea, which can be from Huntington's disease, and uh, athetosis, which is like a twisting or a writhing, and sometimes that's seen in clients with cerebral palsy. They also uh, may have a slow, uncertain gait. The base may become wider, shorter. Hips and knees can be flexed, bent forward. They can shuffle. Walking heel to toe could be difficult. And again, remember, they can be bow-legged and have other issues like that. They're going to be unable to hop from one foot to another. And that can put them at risk for falling or an injury. Uh, rapid alternating movements may be difficult because they have a slower reaction time and they're not as flexible as they used to be. Light, touch, and pain sensations are often decreased. They're not as sensitive to these things. They may be at increased, increased risk for foot and ankle issues as well as a decreased loss of vibratory sense. And that's one of the early signs of sensory loss. So really, this is the um, ability to perceive or feel sensations, and a lot of times uh, this is lost in clients that have peripheral neur neuropathy like diabetics. Uh, we'll also see um, a sense of position of the great toe being reduced. Uh, these clients will usually have intact deep tendon reflexes, but a decrease in their reaction time or a slower response. Some other things, uh, we want to reinforce techniques when we're conducting the deep tendon reflex checking. This can help the older adult who's having a difficult time relaxing. Decreased deep tendon reflexes and unstable balance can be due to peripheral neuropathy. Disturbances in proprioception, that's where their body is in space. Loss of vibratory and temperature senses. Possible pain, tingling, and distal weaknesses. The Achilles reflex may also be absent or hard to elicit, and flexion of the toes might be hard to do uh, because the um, sensation there may be absent. So again, uh, if they're at risk for perif peripheral neuropathy, this might be worse. So diabetics, people that have had chemo. So we're going to ask them about certain uh, things. People that experience symptoms associated with neurological will usually have headaches, memory loss. Uh, they might be fearful that they have some sort of uh, serious condition. Usually, um, the symptoms can be a little subjective in nature. So they may have problems with loss of concentration, loss of sensation, dizziness, numbness, difficulty speaking, difficulty swallowing. So now we're asking about uh, path past health history, any history of headaches, uh, seizures, loss of consciousness, involuntary muscle movement, or sensory disturbances. Any uh, history of dizziness, lightheadedness, balance problems, coordination, any falls, are they, are they clumsy? And then, of course, cold spa using that um, characteristics, onset, location, duration, uh, any decrease in their ability to see or smell or taste. Any decrease in their ability to hear. Any difficulty speaking, swallowing. Uh, any loss of bowel or urine control. Memory loss. Any head injuries with or without loss of consciousness. And have they ever had any meningitis, encephalitis, injury to the spinal cord, any strokes, any sort of physical or mental changes. Then family history. Any family history of high blood pressure, stroke, Alzheimer's, dementia, epilepsy, brain cancer, Huntington Korea. Any, um, and then we're doing lifestyle and health practices. So prescription, non-prescription meds. Uh, alcohol consumed, any recreational drugs like marijuana, tranquilizers, barbiturates, cocaine, do they smoke?
Do they wear a seatbelt when they're riding in the car? Do they wear protective headgear? What's their 24-hour diet like? So peripheral neuropathy can result from deficiencies in things like niacin, folic acid, vitamin B. Also, prolonged exposure to chemicals, insecticides, pollution. Do they lift uh, frequently heavy objects or repetitive? This can lead to uh, disc injuries. Can they perform their normal independent activities of daily living? Any changes with uh, the way they view themselves regarding the neurological condition that they currently have? So we'll do um, an evaluation. We'll look at the mental status, the cranial nerves, the motor, the cerebellar system, the sensory system, and the reflexes. So we're looking at the level of consciousness, their thought processes, their perceptions, how well are they oriented, are they able to concentrate, are they able to use their memory. We may do some depression testing here. Uh, we're looking at behavior and affect, like what's their emotional status, that's the affect. How are they dressed? What's their grooming, their hygiene like? What are their facial expressions like? Is their speech uh, coordinated? Does it make sense? How's their mood, their feeling? We're looking at uh, cranial nerve two as well, and we're evaluating posture, gait, balance, involuntary movement, light touch, and pain. So we might do things like Romberg test, um, we're going to comprehensively test cranial nerves 1 through 12. We're going to look at the um, vibratory sensation, tactile discrimination, deep tenor reflexes, superficial reflexes, and we're going to test for meningeal irritation. Again, all these things we just mentioned, looking at the thought processes, the orientation, the concentration, the slums, that's a depression test. Um, looking at the memory, the judgment, perception, comprehensive testing of those cranial nerves 1 through 12, the Romberg test, looking at coordination, and also rapid alternating movements. Light touch, pain, and temperature, uh, vibratory sensation, the sensitivity to position, so how well do they move, do they get dizzy, things like that tactile discrimination, uh, point localization, graphithesia, and extinction. So tactile discrimination is that ability to differentiate information through the sense of touch. The point localization is the ability to locate a point on the skin that is stimulated. And the graph asthesia is the ability to recognize symbols when they're traced on the skin. It measures cortical function and it requires a normal somatosensory cortex in order for this to actually work. We're also testing superficial and deep tendon reflexes and then using the Brzezinski and Koenig to test for irritated meningitis. So following statement, true or false, some assessments are challenging to complete on the older adult due to the increased risk of falling. So that's true. Some testing maneuvers like standing on one foot or hopping on the other foot or completing the hill to toe maneuver put the client at risk for falling. All right. And this is just due to normal changes in the older person. So again, we're going to do a complete neurological assessment. We're going to evaluate those five things, the mental status, the cranial nerves, the motor and the cerebellar system, the sensory system, and the reflexes. We're going to do a neuro check to check the level of consciousness, how the pupillary checks out movement, strength of the extremities, sensation in the extremities, and we're going to check those vital signs. So to prepare these clients, we're going to have them remove all clothing and jewelry and put on a gown. We'll start with the client sitting with several position changes throughout the assessment. Again, we're seeing how they move within space. Do they have any loss of balance, any dizziness when they move? Uh, the examination will take time, and so you may have to provide rest periods. So for equipment, you will need exam gloves. 
Uh, a cranial nerve exam will require things like a cotton tip applicator, a newsprint for them to read, and a thought ophthalmoscope, a paper clip, a pen light, a Snellen chart, sterile cotton balls, substances for them to smell or taste, a tongue depressor, and a tuning fork. For the motor and cerebellar exam, you'll need a tape measure. And then you'll need, uh, for the sensory exam, the cotton ball, objects for the client to fill, paper clip, test tubes containing hot and cold water, and a tuning fork that reads a low pitch. You'll also need, uh, for the reflex exam, a cotton tip applicator and a reflex percussion hammer. So for the cranial nerve one, the olfactory, you're going to have them identify a scent by presenting one to each nostril. Some of the older clients may have a decreased smell of scent, a sense of smell. Uh, for cranial nerve two, you use a Snellen chart and you're going to assess the vision in each eye. This is for the optic nerve. The client should have 20-20 vision. OD is the right eye and OS is the left eye. You can also have the client read a newspaper or magazine. Uh, you can assess the visual fields. You are going to use an ophthalmoscope here and you're looking for a round red reflex. Cranial nerve three, uh, you're looking at ocular motor. Okay, and also at the same time, you'll be looking at cranial nerve four, trochlear, and cranial nerve six, abducens. So you're looking at the margins of the eyelids of each eye. The eyelid should cover about two millimeters of the iris. Any ptosis is seen in the weakness of eye muscles in clients that have things like uh, myasthenia gravis. You're also um, looking at extraocular movements of the eyes, looking for uh, nystagmus. So this would be uh, the direction or the fastness of the eye. The eyes should move in a smooth, coordinated direction um, in all directions, in a smooth, coordinated manner in all directions. And those are called the six cardinal fills of grades, of, of, of grays. So you might see some abnormal movements, the nystagmus. Um, limited eye movement uh, with increased cranial pressure, paralytic strabismus, which is paralysis, which is paralysis of the ocular motor, the trochlear, or, or the abducens nerve. And you're looking at the pupil response to light, indirect, and direct, and accommodation in both eyes. You're also looking at cranial nerve five, trigeminal. On this, you're testing motor function by having the client clench the teeth while you palpate the temporal and the masseter muscles. <clears throat> These muscles should contract bilaterally. This might be hard if the client doesn't have teeth. You're testing sensory function. So the client should be able to correctly identify sharp and dull uh, stimuli, light touches, to the forehead, the cheek, and the chin. You could do this with a um, paper clip and on the doll side or a uh, cotton ball. You're testing the corneal reflex. The eyes may blink rapidly. For cranial nerve seven, you're testing motor function. Uh, this is the facial one, so you're having the client smile, frown, wrinkle the forehead, show their teeth, puff out their cheeks, purse their lips, raise their eyebrows, and close the eyes tightly against uh, resistance. Also, you're looking for things like um, stroke symptoms, facial drooping, uh, weakness of the arms, um, speech, is it gurgled or slurred? And think about that uh, FAST acronym, facial drooping, arm weakness, speech, and time. If you see any of those symptoms, of course, you're going to immediately call 911. Sensory function of cranial nerve 7 is not routinely tested, all right, um, but we can test it. Um, if we can touch the anterior two-thirds of the tongue with a moistened applicator dipped in salt, sugar, or lemon juice and see if the client can identify the flavor. If it's the client's unsuccessful, we would repeat using one of the other solutions. 
Make sure that the client leaves the tongue protruded, protruded to identify the flavor because the substance may move to the posterior third of the tongue through the vagus nerve. And so then, you know, that wouldn't give them an adequate way to actually test or assess what was on the tongue. Central nervous, I'm sorry, cranial nerve eight, uh, acoustic or vestibulocular, test the client's hearing ability in each ear and perform the Weber and Rene tests to assess the cochlear or auditory component of cranial nerve eight. So for this, um, we might do the whisper test. Uh, the vibration from the Weber test should be uh, heard equally in both ears and the Rene test where we're testing air conduction, which should be greater than bone conduction. Uh, cranial nerve nine. Here we're testing the glossopharyngeal and also 10, the vagus nerve. So we're testing motor function. Ask the client to open the mouth wide and say, ah, oh, why you use a tongue depressor on the tongue. We're looking at the uvula and the soft palate to rise bilaterally and symmetrically. We're testing the gag reflex by touching the posterior pharynx with the tongue depressor to make sure it's intact. Warn the client that you're going to do that. Uh, we're checking the client's ability to swallow by giving him a drink of water, and we're checking the voice quality. Uh, we're looking for no hoarseness. We're checking uh, cranial nerve 11, the spinal accessory, by having the client shrug the shoulders against resistance to assess the trapezius muscle, and this should be symmetric and strong. Then we're asking the client to turn the head against resistance, First to the right, then to the left to look at the sternocleidomastoid muscle. <coughs> and we should have a strong contraction of the sternocleidomastoid muscle on the side of the opposite, on the side opposite the turned face. Uh, then we're testing cranial nerve 12 to assess the strength and the mobility of the tongue and ask the client to protrude the tongue and move it to each side against resistance of the tongue depressor and then put it back in the mouth. So that was hypoglosso. All right, for the uh, motor and cerebellar, we're gonna be looking at some balance uh, exercises so like asking the client to stand on one foot or ask him to hop on a foot we will not necessarily do this with the older adult because they may not have the ability to do this and it could put them at risk for falling we're looking at coordination demonstrating like the finger to nose test to see if they can coordinate those movements we're also um, looking at uh, tandem balance test we're assessing the rapid alternating movements by having the client sit down, asking them to touch each finger to the thumb and increase the speed and repeat on the other side. Again, older adults may have difficulty with this task because of decreased reaction time and flexibility. We're having the client put the palms, both hands down on both legs and then turn the palms up again and ask them to increase the speed. We'll have them do the heel to shin test. Have them lie down and slide the heel of the right foot down the, sh the left shin and repeat the other way. We'll also have them um, – if they're unconscious, we'll note their posture, okay, and we'll look for things like decorticate or decerebate posturing, um, and that could indicate for decorticate that cortical loss is present or decerebate that they have a midbrain issue. We'll also evaluate uh, sensory. So light touch is what we're checking, all right? And we might use um, like some sort of cotton ball. We'll have the client close the eyes and we're gonna put some kind of stimuli on them and we wanna see if they can identify it or fill it. Some older clients, light touch and pain sensations may be decreased. To touch light sensation, we'll use like a wisp of a cotton, 
okay? And then we'll use the blunt and the sharp ends of a safety or a paper clip and see if the client can tell us the difference between them. We also might use different sensations like hot and cold body temperatures. So using test tubes filled with hot and cold water. Temperature and pain sensations travel in the spinothalamic tract. So temperature need not be tested if pain sensation is intact. We'll test vibratory sensation using a low pitched tuning fork on the heel of the hand and at the base of the distal radius. Again, we're trying to see if the client identifies the sensation. Older adults are at an increased risk for foot and ankle pathologies and a decrease or loss of vibratory sensation is one of the early signs of sensory loss. So we'll see this a lot of times in clients that have peripheral neuropathy or chronic alcohol abuse. We'll test uh, sensitivity in regards to position. We'll look at uh, tactile discrimination, uh, point localization, graphithesia, and extinction. So remember the um, sensitivity position is where they are in space, tactile discrimination, can they discriminate between the touch, uh, point localization, are they able to point to the area of skin that was touched, the graphesthesia, can they recognize a drawing on the skin, So we're doing all these points, okay, to test. And I would just look at these um, in the chart on page 586 so you can see how they all are. And then extinction, extinction, extinction where we simultaneously touch the client in the same area on both sides of the body at the same point. And we ask the client to identify what area was touched. We'll look at deep tendon reflexes. Some older adults um, may have a decreased reaction in the time or in the response. However, the deep tendon reflexes themselves should be intact. So we can put the client in the um, comfortable position and use the reflex hammer to try to elicit these. Also, we want the client to relax because that's going to help them feel the reflexes better. We'll test the biceps reflex by having them bend the arm at the elbow with the palm up. We'll, attest, we'll assess the brachial radial, radialis reflex by having the client flex the elbow uh, with the palm down and the hand resting on the abdomen or the lap. Again, this would cause flexation and supination of the forearm. We'll look at the triceps reflex, where we ask the client to hang, hang the arm freely. And you support it with your non-dominant hand with the elbow flexed, and then use the flat side of the hammer reflex to tap the tendon above the old cranium process. The elbow should extend, and the tricep muscle will contract. These are all on page 586 in your book. We'll assess the patellar reflex where the client is going to have both legs hanging freely off the side of the exam table, and we're going to tap the patellar. We'll use the uh, Achilles reflex with the client's leg hanging freely, and we'll dorsiflex the foot and tap the Achilles tendon with the flat side. Again, in some older adults, the Achilles reflex may be absent or hard to elicit. We should have some response in a normal person. We're testing the ankle clonus. So when the other reflexes tested are hyperactive, place one hand under the knee to support the leg and briskly dorsiflex the foot towards the client's head. Repeat on the other side. There should be no rapid contractions or oscillations of the ankle. And then test superficial reflexes whose receptors are in the skin rather than the muscle. In some older adults, flexion of the toes may be difficult to elicit. So with the end of the reflex hammer or the tongue blade, we'll stroke the lateral aspect of the sole from the heel to the ball of the foot, curving immediately across the ball and repeat on the other side. This evaluates the function of spinal levels L4 
L5, S1, and S2. We'll also try to elicit a normal planter response and a positive Babinski sign. We'll test the abdominal reflex. Uh, for this, we're looking at the, um, we're stroking the abdomen on each side and above the umbilicus, and this evaluates function of spinal levels T8, T9, and T10. Also, the upper abdominal reflex, spinal levels T10, T11, and T12 with the lower abdominal reflex. So the abdominal muscles will contract, and the umbilicus will deviate towards the side that's being stimulated here. The abdominal reflex can be concealed if someone's obese or from regular stretching from pregnancies. We'll test the chromastic, the chromasteric reflex in male clients by stroking the inner aspect of the upper thigh, and that evaluates the function of spinal levels T12, L1, and L2. The scrotum elevates on the stimulated side. Also, you're going to test for meningeal irritation or inflammation if you suspect anything. All right. Um, this would be the client would be supine with your hands behind the client's head and you flex the neck towards forward until the chin touches the chest if possible. All right. The neck should be able to easily bend. Te test for Brzezinski sign. As you flex the neck, watch the hips and knees in reaction to your maneuver. They should remain relaxed and motionless. But if there's pain, then we have um, or flexion of the hips and knees, then we have a positive sign. Test for Koenig's sign by flexing the client's legs at both the hip and the knee, and then straighten the knee. No pain is felt. That's what we want. If we have pain or increased resistance uh, extending the knee, then we have a positive sign. We're going to validate and collect the uh, data, uh, verify that the data are correct and reliable, and we'll do this through, you know, the neurological assessment, the cues, the inferences, uh, looking at uh, documentation, ask, looking at the facts and the uh, data that we've collected, and also um, describing the client's response to what uh, testing that we've done. And then we'll look for a list of client concerns. We'll use cold spa, S bar, all of which we've already talked about. Cold spa, you know, um, characteristics, onset, location, duration, the S bar situation, background assessment, recommendations. We'll do a summary sheet of international standards, or we'll look at that or neurological and functional classification of any spinal cord injuries, if it applies. Uh, selected client concerns, so opportunities to improve health. We want to improve communication. Uh, risk for client concerns, so risk for injury, especially if they have an eye or a hearing issue. Risk for aspiration associated with the impaired gag reflex. Risk for violent behaviors towards self-association with history of depression, suicide, or developmental crises, lack of support. Then some actual client concerns, poor ability, ability to verbally communicate associated with aphasia, psychological impairment or organic brain disorder, confusion associated with dementia, head injury, stroke, alcohol, or drug abuse. Poor memory associated with dementia, stroke, head injury, alcohol, or drug abuse. Impulsive behaviors, again, associated with substance abuse, codependency, developmental disorders, or organic brain disorders. Poor swallowing ability with absent gag reflex. Decreased muscle strength for mastication or facial paralysis. And there's a few more there. Uh, that's on page 605, so you can go back and look. All right, select co collaborative problems so um risk for complications for increased cranial pressure definitely going to need the doctor there 
uh, stroke, so you may need some sort of TPA, or if they're bleeding, uh, you may have to figure out something else for that portion. Uh, risk for seizures, spinal cord compression, meningitis, again, you're going to need antibiotics, you're going to have to culture, uh, cranial nerve impairment, paralysis, peripheral nerve impairment, all these risks for complications. Uh, so you'll need, uh, you know, physician's help, therapy, things like that to collaborate with you to fix those areas. And also, um, after you group the data, the client's signs and symptoms may require some sort of medical diagnosis and treatment as well. Is the following statement true or false? The nurse should use a high-pitched tuning fork to evaluate the client's sensory function. False. They should use a low-pitched tuning fork to evaluate the client's sensory function. So cerebral vascular accidents, also known as a stroke, happens sometimes when blood flow to a part of the brain is interrupted or stops which deprives the brain cells of oxygen. If the blood flow is blocked for more than a few seconds, then the brain cells begin to die and permanent da brain damage may result. There are several types of strokes, hemorrhagic, ischemic, and TIA or trans ischemic attack. The National Stroke Association describes hemorrhagic and ischemic strokes. Hemorrhagic strokes result when a brain aneurysm bursts or a weakened blood vessel in the brain leaks and hemorrhagic strokes are less common, but account for about 40% of the strokes. Ischemic strokes occur when the blood vessel carrying the blood to the brain is blocked by a clot. These clots can be embolic, move through the vessel, or thrombotic, develop in the vessel. A mini stroke that causes no damage but indicates stroke risk is called a TIA. Stroke symptoms of a TIA usually last a short time, but can last for up to 24 hours before the symptoms disappear. Stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, it's the leading cause of disabilities, and it can occur in people that have no known risk factors. Some people believe that um, strokes are not common and that they can't be prevented. In the United States, about 800 strokes happen every year, one about 40 seconds, and about 80% of them are preventable. Some believe that only um, affects the older adult. It can happen to anyone at any time. Some believe there's no treatment available. At any sign, call 911 because we may be able to do treatment. It happens to the heart, some people believe, but it's actually a brain attack. Some people believe recovery only happens for the first few months after a stroke, but it's actually a lifelong process. Some believe that they're rare. However, in the United States, 7 million stroke survivors exist. It's the fifth leading cause of death. It definitely is hereditary. If the symptoms go away, uh, you still need to call a doctor, even if it's a TIA, because that's a warning sign of a pending stroke. So some uh, risk for developing a stroke are things like hypertension, diabetes, heart disease and blood vessel disease, smoking, exposure to secondhand smoke, brain aneurysms or atrial venous malformations, infections or conditions that cause inflammation, age and gender, race, ethnicity, personal and or family history. all contributing factors. So what do you teach those clients? One, if you smoke, quit. Two, keep your cholesterol under control. High blood pressure, diabetes, exercise, medications. So first the cholesterols. So those fatty, fatty foods, okay? And also um, exercise can help control cholesterol. Decreasing your stress can help control it. Keep your blood pressure under control because that makes the vessels weak. And then blood sugar because that sugar is going to eat the vessels. All right, so you want to keep that under control. You want to exercise. 
and take your medications. So exercise at least 30 minutes a day. Maintain a healthy weight. No obesity here. Choose foods that are rich um, or diets that are rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean proteins, and low-fat dairy products. And then avoid sodium and fats found in fried foods, processed foods, and baked goods. Teach the client about eating fewer animal products. That's going to help with those lipids. Uh, about um, staying away from foods that have cheese, cream, or eggs. Again, those can increase cholesterol. Read the labels. Stay away from things like saturated fat, poly, poly, partially hydrogenated or hydrogenated fat. Uh, limit the amount of alcohol. Again, that can increase your blood pressure and your lipids. Avoid cocaine and other illegal drugs. And talk to the doctor about any risk factors regarding birth control pills. Teach the client to recognize the symptoms of stroke and act fast. So fast is facial drooping. Have the client smile. Does one side of the face droop down? Look at the arms. Is there any weakness? Can they raise both hands? Or does one arm drift downward or in another direction? How's the client's speech? Are they able to repeat a simple phrase? Is the speech slurred or strange? If so, if you see any one of these signs, call 911 immediately to avoid a lifelong disability. Teach the client to recognize additional signs of a stroke, numbness or weakness on one side of the face, the arm, or the leg, sudden confusion, difficulty speaking or understanding speech, difficulty or trouble seeing in one or both eyes, sudden trouble walking, dizziness, loss of balance or coordination, and sudden severe headache with no known cause. So this on the left is a cross section of the spinal cord and it's demonstrated the major tracts of the spinal cord. On the right, you see the brown C cord syndrome, a hemisection of the spinal cord resulting in ipsilateral loss of strength and proprioception and contralateral loss of pain and temperature. Here we see central cord syndrome where the injury results in sacral sparing and preferentially upper more than lower extremity weakness. And then on the right, we have anterior cord syndrome where the injury results in variable loss of motor function as well as pain and temperature. Appropriate reception is reserved here. And then we have posterior cord syndrome where the injury results in the loss of proprioception and variable preservation of motor function, pain, and temperature sensation. Again, you can look at these on page 605 in your book. We also have uh, atrophy and fasciculations of the tongue in the client with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis so here um, the client has you know ALS and so everything's starting to um, decrease in size here in the mouth so the tongue is actually going to atrophy in this client on the right we have ticks these are brief uh, repetitive stereotype coordinated movements occurring at regular intervals this is an eye tick so this may cause repetitive winking, grimacing, and shoulder shrug shrugging. Causes include Tourette's syndrome and drugs like phenothiazines and amphetamines. Uh, Coriform movements of the hand. These are brief, rapid, jerky, irregular, and unpredictable movements. They can happen at rest or they can interrupt normal coordinated movements. Unlike ticks, they don't repeat themselves usually. The face, the head, the lower arm, and the hands are often involved. The causes include Sindaham chorea with rheumatic fever and Huntington's disease. And then resting or static tremors. These tremors are prominent at rest and may decrease or disappear with voluntary movement. Um, and we may see these uh, like in that uh, fine pill rolling tremor of Parkinson's. 
about five per second. Postural tremors, these occur when the affected part is actively maintaining a posture. So they can be fine, rapid tremor from hyperthyroidism, tremors of anxiety and fatigue. They may be benign or essential, and the tremor may worsen with intention. So intention tremor of a pointed finger. This is intention tre tremors that are absent at rest. They appear with activity and often get worse as the target is neared. Causes include disorder of the cellular pathways, as in MS. We have atheotosis. This is athetoid movements, and they're slower, a little bit more twisted and rhythm, rhythm than the core form movements. They have a larger amplitude, and they're commonly um, happening and involve the face and distal extremities. This is associated with spasticity, things like cerebral palsy. The, path, the, the pathway of tremor impulse down the arm of a male figure. The motor cortex is where the impulse for movement is generated. The basal ganglia and the cella, cerebellum are responsible for ensuring that movement is carried out in a smooth, coordinated manner. The basal ganglia are responsible for activating and inhibiting specific motor circuits. The basal ganglia include the striatum, the globus pallidus, the subthalamic nucleus, and substantia nigra. These clusters of nerves are interconnected to each other in complex feedback loops. They are also interconnected with the motor cortex and the thalamus. With uh, cerebellar ataxia, the client will have a wide base, a staggering, unsteady gait. They'll have a positive Romberg test, meaning the client can't stand with the feet together. And this is seen in cerebellar diseases or alcohol or drug intoxication. An individual normally walks a little bit differently from everyone else, but sometimes a person's gait is distinctively abnormal. And so that's what we see here. Parkinsonian's gait. Uh, with this, we'll have a shuffling gait. Uh, they're um, walking in a very stiff sort of manner. They may have a stooped over posture with flex tips and knees. And this is typically seen in Parkinson's or drug-induced Parkinsonian. And this is because of the effects on the basal ganglia. Uh, scissors gait. This is where we have a stiff, short gait. The thighs overlap each other with each step. And it's seen with partial paralysis of the legs. Next to that, we have spastic hemiparesis. This is where we have a flexed arm held close to the body while the client drags the toe or the leg or circles it stiffly outward and forward. This is seen with lesions in the upper motor neuron, in the cortical spinal tract, and also um, lesions that may occur in strokes. Foot drop. The client lifts the foot and the knee high with each step, then slaps the foot down hard on the ground. They cannot walk on the hills. This is characteristic of diseases that affect the no, lower motor neurons. Then we have decorticate and decerebate posturing. Decorticate occurs with lesions of the cerebral cortex. The arms, the wrists, and the fingers are flexed and the arms are adducted lower extremities extended internally rotated with plantar flexion of the feet so everything goes towards the core with the cerebrate posturing this occurs with lesions of the brain lesions of the brain stem at the midbrain or the upper pons the arms are extended adducted internally rotated and the wrists are pronated and the fingers flexed the back is hyperextended the teeth are clenched and the legs are extended with plantar flexion Also, um, in clients that have myasthenia gravis, we'll see muscular eye weakness. This can be attributed to ocular motor nerve damage, weakened muscle tissues, or um, a congenital issue. 
Question five, is the following statement true or false? A potential warning sign of a stroke is sudden weakness on one side of the body. And that is true. Sudden weakness on one side of the body is a warning sign and possible indication that the client is having a stroke and needs immediate care. If the individual is not at the appropriate medical facility, then 911 may be called to transport the client immediately.